Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the RHEL Mid-Atlantic webinar on Pathways into Teaching. I'm Elizabeth Greniger, and we have with us today Dr. Pam Grossman from Stanford University, who will be presenting on our topic of Pathways into Teaching. Before we get started with the exciting presentation, I'd like to review some of the features of the webinar layout. Right now on your screen, you'll see my photo in the top left corner, and soon we'll be switching to the photo of our presenter. Below that, you'll see a questions about content box. This is the place where you can ask any questions throughout the webinar, and we'll do our best to address those questions as we're presenting or during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Below that box, you'll find a technical issues box. And that box is for any questions you have related to sound or um, screen issues. And one of the people from our team will get back to you to help you troubleshoot that. In the bottom left of the screen, you'll see the caption first box. And that box is the closed captioning for the presentation. You can adjust the text size, font, or background color as needed. And you can also adjust the screen by clicking on the bar with the arrow pointing up. Also on the bottom of your screen, you'll find a resources box. In this box, you'll find a version of the PowerPoint available for download. And finally, on the bottom right of your screen, you'll see the links box. And this holds the feedback survey and the link to our teacher effectiveness forum. We hope that you'll take a minute to complete the survey at the time when you leave the webinar. We understand if you can't tune in for the entire duration. So we've made this survey available so you can uh, find it at your convenience. We'll also be using some interactive features during this webinar. At various points, we'll pose questions to which we'll ask you to respond. Some are multiple choice, and others are open-ended and require you to type your response. At the conclusion of the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session where, we'll ask some que well, where we will address some questions that you pose throughout the webinar and any other questions you have for the presenter. Here's our webinar agenda. You'll see that we're right now we're doing the welcome. Next, I'll be showing you a short video from the RHEL Mid-Atlantic director, Teresa Duncan, who will describe a little bit about the RHEL Mid-Atlantic and give some more information about this webinar series. Then I'll introduce our presenter, and she'll spend a little over an hour presenting some very valuable information about teaching pathways. Once her presentation concludes, we'll open up for questions from the audience and Dr. Grossman will respond to those questions. Finally, we'll conclude with some final thoughts on the topic and wrap up by 5 o'clock Eastern time. At this time, we'll show a short video about the RHEL Mid-Atlantic. Welcome to today's RHEL Mid-Atlantic webinar. RHEL Mid-Atlantic serves Delaware, the District of Columbia, Maryland, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. As you probably know, the Regional Educational Laboratories, or RELs, are part of the Institute of Education Sciences, the research arm of the U.S. Department of Education. Our primary mission is to form research alliances with educators and policymakers to help states and school districts use research results to answer important questions about education policy and practice. Our services include direct research and technical assistance products and services. This webinar falls into the category of technical assistance, which includes bridge events, trainings, workshops, how-to guides, and white papers. Through webinars like this one, we hope to reach educators who are interested in but are unable to attend our live bridge events. Our goal for the webinar series is to provide an online space for conversation where you can work with experts and with your colleagues on the education challenges that you care about. At the end of each session, we'll ask you to rate us by completing a brief survey. Your input is important and will help us to better serve your needs. We hope that you'll find this webinar informative and engaging. And now, let's get started. So the goal of our Teacher Effectiveness webinar series is to provide stakeholders in the Mid-Atlantic region with opportunities to discuss multiple topics within the field of teacher effectiveness. 
this is the seventh in our series, and I see many of you have probably tuned in to our uh, prior session. One of the goals of these sessions is to increase participants' understanding and use of research-based teacher effectiveness strategies. So now we'd like to find out who's in our audience today. You'll see a poll pop up onto your screen, and we'd like you to select the role that best fits the role you serve in um, your profession. Hey, it looks like we have a good number of researchers and other stakeholders with us today, and a few less teachers and administrators. Um, I think that anyone attending today will find that the material you're being presented with will help you understand from your context about how the various pathways into teaching are relevant to the issue of teacher effectiveness. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pam Grossman. Dr. Grossman is the Nomalini Olivier Professor of Education at Stanford University School of Education. She's a faculty director at the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching. She has a distinguished record of research on teacher education and classroom practices in English language arts. Her teaching and research interests focus on the education of teachers, the relationship between teacher education and knowledge, and policy and programmatic issues related to teacher education. Her current research includes collaboration with other experts in the field of a, a study on classroom practices in middle school English language arts and a studies of pathways into teaching in New York City schools and a cross-professional study of preparation of clergy, teachers, and clinical psychologists. She has served as the Vice President of Division K, Teacher and Teacher Education for the American Educational Research Association. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pam Grossman. Hello and uh, welcome to the webinar. I'm excited to use this uh, new media to begin to present some of these results and to engage in a conversation with you about how best to prepare high-quality teachers. Um, we know that teachers make an enormous difference to student ach uh, achievement, and so one of the questions that I've been interested in is what are the features of preparation that best prepare teachers for the challenges that they'll face? So let's start with a little bit of an overview about what we'll be talking about today. Uh, we'll be talking generally about how to think about pathways into teaching in a broader context. Then we'll define the, what we mean by these different pathways and the existing research evidence, um, talk a little bit about elements of effective pathways, and then do a deeper dive into the study that I did with my colleagues Susanna Loeb, Jim Wyckoff, Don Boyd, and Hamp Lankford on pathways into teaching in New York City. We'll then step back from that and talk a little bit about some of the conclusions from this work, and policy implications. So let me start by addressing the broader context for teacher preparation. Um, one of the things that's important to realize is that how teachers are prepared is only one piece of this broader um, issue related to the teacher workforce. So this diagram tries to give you a sense of some of the other things that play into issues of teacher quality. For example, the, what teachers bring into preparation programs clearly matters. Their prior academic ability, prior experiences in teaching, um, their uh, career intentions when they enter, all of those things are things that individuals bring into the program and may affect which programs they choose to enter. Similarly, there are state requirements that govern teacher education programs. 
um, related to teacher certification. So states differ dramatically on the policies about the kinds of coursework or field experiences that teacher candidates might have, must have, and preparation programs have to work within those state requirements. The schools in which uh, the teachers work also matter enormously when we think about issues of teacher quality. Uh, and so one of the things that we're concerned about is whether or not there is a selection of particular programs into different kinds of schools. And then in order to parse out the impact of preparation, you would have to think about the role of the, the students and the school context in how that affects uh, things like student achievement. So you can see that in all of the, um, this complex diagram, the preparation, the pathways, are only one component of a much broader context. But it's the one we'll be focusing on today. At the same time, we will be, in these models that we run, we try to take account of many of these other factors as well. So um, as I mentioned, you know, part of the challenge for researchers is that there are two different potential mechanisms through which pathways affect the production of effective teachers. The first is through selection and recruitment. So one of the ways you can get really high quality teachers is to try to select people on the attributes that you think will really uh, matter in terms of their teaching performance. So some pathways focus a lot on the issue of selection and recruitment into that particular pathway. The second piece, of course, is the professional preparation you receive during um, teacher education. And that has to do with the kinds of courses you take, the kind of field experience you have, the kind of supervision you get, and we'll be diving into all of those in the course of this presentation. All pathways are some combination of selection, who they manage to get into their pathway, and then how they prepare those individuals for classrooms. The final thing is that pathways differ on where their graduates go on to teach. So as I said, this is the sort of selection me mechanism. So some alternative route pathways, for example, place their students almost exclusively in higher poverty schools. Um, whereas other uh, settings might have teachers across a variety of school contexts. So when we're trying to understand the impact of the pathway, we also have to look at the um, effect of that school context. So the, some of the most common preparation programs uh, fit into these three categories, and they'll be the categories we're going to talk about a little bit more. First, there's what's called the traditional or university-based uh, pathway. The labels often, often get in the way because, as we'll see, many of the alternative route pathways are also based in universities. But the traditional route is a, a four-year uh, degree program. Um, this is most often undergraduate, where people complete all of their requirements prior to becoming the teacher of record. Um, alternative routes are ones where they may or may not be linked to a university. Uh, and often, the teachers going through this pathway begin teaching after relatively brief preparation. And finally, there are the residency programs in which uh, that work closely with districts. Um, so Boston Teacher Residency is one uh, longstanding example of that. You can see the dimensions on which the pathways differ have to do with who is the primary provider, the timing of coursework and support relative to becoming a full-time teacher of record, and then how responsive to the labor market these pathways are. So let's um, go a little bit more into the definition of these pathways. So as I said, the traditional teacher preparation programs are generally provided by universities. 65% um, of these programs uh, are at the undergraduate level, and a little less than 20% are at graduate programs. There are also some five-year programs that span the undergraduate and graduate programs. In what are more traditional programs, the coursework is completed 
prior to the teacher being certified and taking on responsibility as a teacher of record. And people often get field experiences concurrent or following that coursework. So field experience includes things like student teaching, early field experiences, a whole range of experiences that get teacher candidates into schools. Uh, University-based programs are generally preparing teachers for a fairly wide labor market. So they typically don't target a specific district um, because they're, you know, their graduates can go on and teach in a range of places. So while they prepare people for state certification, they're not focused, for example, on preparing teachers for a single district. The research on uh, traditional pathways suggests that one of the factors that matters enormously in how effective the pathway is, is the value of carefully designed field experiences. So uh, the quality of the student teaching experience and the nature of the supervision that they get during that experience seems to matter in terms of outcomes. Um, Matt Ronfeld uh, at the University of Michigan did a study looking at the school context in which people did their student teaching and found that it was very important for teachers to teach in better functioning schools, which he defined as schools that had lower teacher attrition. Um, the teachers who did their student teaching in those schools actually had greater impact on both student achievement and also had greater retention than the students who did their field experience in what we called lower functioning schools, schools where there was high teacher turnover. There's also been research on the value of doing your field experience in a professional development school. And the research suggests that there's generally a positive impact. Um, again, that might have to do with the nature of that school and the features of professional development schools. They may have been chosen because they are better functioning schools with stronger leadership. Um, and again, teachers who are prepared in professional development schools are more likely to stay in the profession longer. Finally, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, programmatic coherence. And uh, we can define coherence as the, um, both the alignment between pe what people are hearing at the university setting and what they're experiencing in this field, um, and the the ways in which they hear similar messages about teaching across the program. And there's been some research that, again, suggests that teachers from programs with greater coherence have more positive impacts. So one of the things that's really changed over the last 20 years in the landscape of teacher education is the growth of alternative pathways into teaching. So this slide just shows you a range of the various programs, and it's only a subset of the alternative pathways that are available right now for teaching in New York City schools. So when we think about alternative, again, one of the um, things we want to think about is who the provider is. So the providers of alternative routes can be nonprofits, such as Teach for America, but they can also be school districts. Um, for example, the New York City Teaching Fellows that have partnered with the New Teacher Project. They can be charter schools that are increasingly now developing their own teacher education programs, such as the Aspire Teacher Residency or High Tech High. And there is also a role for higher education. So many of the alternative routes uh, in New York that we studied actually partnered with local universities to provide the coursework and uh, certification. So both, for example, Teach for America and Teaching Fellows were partnering with the same universities in New York City that were providing the university-based programs. Um, another difference is the timing and focus of the coursework and support that candidates receive. Um, in alternative routes, generally, people get a, a five to six week introduction um, that is very intensive and focuses a lot on kind of being prepared to take over the classroom on the first day. And then they continue their preparation while they're actually teaching. 
So the coursework is not completed prior to taking on responsibility uh, as teacher of record, and they are concurrently doing the coursework as they are full-time teachers. Alternative routes tend to be much more sensitive to uh, labor market issues. So again, first they focus on high need areas. And when Teach for America first began, for example, it, it targeted uh, places like rural Louisiana where they had a very hard time finding teachers. Um, in New York, they, uh, uh, the New York City Teaching Fellows largely replaced the emergency credentials or teachers on temporary license. So they target those uh, high need areas. And they're more likely to prepare teachers for a specific district and really respond to the needs of that district. So um, the new teaching fellows has altered the, the kinds of teachers it's recruited based on the needs of New York City schools. So before we go on, um, we, we're interested in what percentage of teachers you thought are prepared through alternative routes in the US. So there's a range, a well-distributed range of responses here. It looks like um, sort of a third of you think that roughly 10%, a third of you, less than a third, think that 35%, some think as many as 50%, and uh, some think 5%. So let's take a look at the answer to this. So 80% of aspiring teachers in the US overall are still enrolled in traditional programs. The other 20% enter through one of many, at least 130, and it probably is growing, um, alternative routes. But the story differs dramatically by state. So just as an example here, you'll see that New Jersey, which was one of the early um, providers of a state-based alternative route program has roughly 40% of its teachers entering through alternative programs, whereas Alaska and Oregon have none because they don't have alternative route programs. Texas has over half of its teachers coming through alternative routes. So there's really quite a bit of variability by state and context about where teachers are, which teacher pathway they're entering from. One of the things, though, that you can see in this slide is the growth of alternative certification programs in the US. So back in 1985, there were very, very few teachers entering through alternative route programs, and the number has grown um, exponentially. Again, as you see in Texas, this is the dramatic, a fairly dramatic change again in the uh, decade plus between 1997 and 2009. Uh, with that 52% coming through alternative routes. So what do we know about uh, the evidence on the impact of alternative routes? Um, one of the reasons that alternative routes were developed was to try to recruit a more diverse population of teachers into the classroom. And again, in general, across all of the alternative routes, they generally are more successful at recruiting more diverse students both in terms of race and ethnicity and in terms of gender. Um, their alternative routes include, as I mentioned, this wide variety of programs. And so one of the, the cautionary notes about looking at this evidence is that they include everything from what we'll call fast track programs that have very minimal pre-service preparation to much longer internship programs that have substantial coursework and substantial fieldwork and look a lot like some university-based programs. Another uh, finding is that there's evidence of generally higher teacher turnover in teachers who come through alternative routes, but that degree of turnover differs uh, by the specific pathway. So Teach for America, for example, has a much higher attrition rate 
than the teacher residency program and also has a higher attrition rate than some of the teaching fellow programs in the urban districts across the country. Some of this higher turnover explained, is explained in part by the school context. So in general, schools that are under-resourced, higher poverty schools, are more likely to have higher teacher turnover. And teachers from some of these alternative routes are more likely to be teaching in those schools. So the school context may account for some of that. But another may have to do with the kind of person who is entering through that pathway. They may not have made the commitment to teaching as a career in the way that people who are enrolling in a more traditional program might have made. So there's differences um, in both of that. Most of this research has been done on the effectiveness of Teach for America. Um, in part because it's been around for quite a while and there's been an interest in looking at its impact. Across multiple studies, there's some evidence that uh, teachers from Teach for America have a greater impact than teachers from other uh, pathways on student achievement in secondary math, that's middle and high school math, but less impact on elementary literacy outcomes. So again, we've seen this finding, and you can see the citations at the bottom of the screen, um, that for math and science, the TFA teachers seem to be slightly more effective than teachers who are coming through other pathways. But as I said, in elementary literacy, they're a little less effective. And that may, again, have to do with the attributes of the people who are going through the program. Um, one of the things we found is they're much more likely to have taken more math in high school, and so they come in with some mathematical um, strengths that may translate into that. Um, the impact of TFA, however, is lessened by the high attrition of teachers. So in our work that I'll talk about a little later, we simulated what happens to these, the impact of these different pathways when you build in the attrition of teachers and replace them with first-year teachers. And one of the things that that shows is that even if on average you have a little less impact on student achievement, if you stay in longer, the pathway as a whole can have a little bit more impact. So retention matters. I guess that's the high-level point on that. Um, we've also done some research on the New York City Teaching Fellows. And uh, the New York C City Teaching Fellows, in some ways, is similar to Teach for America. It has a uh, five to six week preparation in the summer. And then the fellows continue to take courses during their uh, full time teaching. Um, they're recruiting, in some ways, from a similar pool. But they're interested in identifying people who are committed to teaching in New York City over a longer haul. Uh, in their first year, the teaching fellows had less impact on student achievement in elementary and middle school ELA um, and in elementary math relative to teachers from more traditional routes. But after their first year, they, did, they were comparable to the teachers who were coming through university-based routes, except for middle school ELA. So you, again, you can see that there are some subject matter differences on the outcomes. Because even with the New York City Teaching Fellows, they were unable to recruit enough math teachers, they developed the Math Immersion Program that was designed to prepare more math teachers for New York City. So this is a nice example of being very responsive to a labor market need. So the uh, New York City Teaching Fellows developed a program that brought people in for some uh, intensive math courses in the summer in addition to the the teacher preparation. And what they found is that uh, those teachers were a little less effective in grades 6 through 8 on math achievement from teachers than teachers from other pathways, um, including the, the regular New York City teaching fellows. The third big category of pathway uh, is the teacher residency program. And these have developed over the last, uh, you know, the last five to six years. Um, in this case, the provider is the school district, 
nonprofit, and sometimes university. So we mentioned the Boston Teacher Residency. Aspire, which is a charter management organization here in California and also in Memphis, runs its own teacher residency program. And then there's the example of the San Francisco Teacher Residency Program, which is a partnership between the University of San Francisco, Stanford, and uh, the San Francisco Unified School District. So these are generally partnership models. Um, they have intensive preparation during the residency year in which the residents are placed with uh, mentor teachers in the district. And they spend an extensive time in the classrooms with their school-based mentors. So these are school-based programs that still have uh, coursework during that first year. Districts typically then hire the, those people in the second year of the program where they become the teachers of record. Um, again, these, these programs are very sensitive to labor markets. They're run um, in many ways by the districts and are very attuned to the needs of the schools in those districts. And they're preparing the teachers for the specific schools in which they'll be working. So they may spend more time on being prepared within the specific um, framework by which teachers might be evaluated in that district, as one example, because they're only preparing teachers for that district. So the residency programs are new enough that there's, there's limited research evidence. Um, there's been one study of the Boston Teacher Residency Program, which has been around long enough to have enough graduates to study. And one of the things that they found was that the graduates of this program are more likely to remain teaching in the district. Um, so they succeeded on attracting people and, and getting people to, to stay in that district. Initially, they were no more effective than teachers from other pathways in raising student test scores in uh, English and a little bit less effective in math but that there were strong gains to um, experience. So by their fifth year, the graduates outperformed the veteran teachers. So this is worth pausing and discussing for a minute, because part of the question of doing research on pathways is, when do you look for impact? And how does that impact play out over time? So here it's an example of the, of the graduates of the program becoming more effective each year, and also staying long enough for those effects to be felt by students. When we think across all of these programs and think about then what would we want to look at in defining an effective pathway, we have to look in some ways beyond the label. One of the things that this research found was that there was as much variation within any of these pathways in terms of teacher quality as there was across pathways. So every pathway had very effective and less effective teachers. So one of the questions is, what could we be doing to really maximize the, the um, production of the most effective teachers? One has to do with the quality of the candidates that are recruited into those programs and asking ourselves, what are the, these programs doing right in recruiting and selecting teachers? So again, trying to recruit people who have strong content knowledge, um, who come in with, uh, and again, TFA has done a lot of its own research on how to recruit people who um, are good at working in under-resourced settings. Um, there are a variety of both things having to do with academic qualifications, as well as uh, your kind of ability to work in challenging settings that we would need to be recruiting for. The second set has to do with preparation. So again, the difference in um, between TFA and university-based routes around elementary literacy might have to do with the professional knowledge that you can gain during preparation programs around the teaching of elementary reading. There is a professional knowledge base we know quite a bit about that now. So how do we, again, ensure that programs um, incorporate that into their preparation? 
We also know more about the kinds of field experiences that seem to have an impact on student achievement. So how do we ensure that pathways provide high quality placements and high quality supervision of their candidates? And finally, in evaluating an effectiveness of a pathway, you would want to look both at the impact of the graduates, what impact do they have on student achievement, but also on retention, how long they stay. Because again, long-term impact of a pathway is a combination of both of those things. So let's stop and have you think for a minute about your own context and um, have you respond to the question about the most common certification pathways or routes into teaching in your particular region or state? And then why you think um, those patterns exist? So take a minute and respond to that question. So it looks like so far that people are saying traditional pathways are more common in their region. Now I'm seeing quite a lot of responses. Yeah. In Pennsylvania, some alternative programs are growing. I think that that's similar in other states. And based on what Pam showed us a little bit earlier, we do know that some states are showing an increase in alternative routes. I see someone mentioned the Troops to Teachers grant. Mm -hmm. Pam, can you speak to that? Do you know anything about that program? Yes, that was an, an early alternative route that um, saw an opportunity to bring people who had been in the military into the classroom and provided a pathway for that transition. So took people and built on um, their prior experiences in the military and placed them in classrooms. And uh, yes, that's been around for a while. I see we do have someone here from Texas. and. I myself was an alternative certification director in the state of Texas and know that in that state alternative routes are booming and um, there's an effort to figure out how to make them at a quality that school districts will feel confident in hiring the teachers from these programs. And I think that, that a lot of the comments here are related to this point that you know, there's a wide variety across states of traditional and alternative. And some of what you see, um, so one of the responses talks about teacher shortages. And again, the, the emergence of teacher shortage areas has uh, led to a rise in alternative pathways that might address those. So um, the, the math immersion program is one example of that. And then some of these are also a function of state policy. Um, so some states, I think including Florida, um, mandate uh, some kind of alternative program be available to teachers. It's interesting, too. I see another comment related to educational leadership programs and the, the alternative pathways for leaders. What can you tell us about that, Pam? Um, well, I think that's been, an, you know, again, one of the uh, things people have studied is how principals feel about teachers from these different pathways. Um, and I think that there are a number of areas in which 
uh, principals report a preference for teachers from alternative route uh, pathways, um, in part because of the, the kind of characteristics and qualifications they bring into that setting. And other times there will be um, uh, districts that have a clear preference for a particular provider in that program. So there's a charter school charter management organization here, the Summit Public Schools, that hires a lot of Stanford graduates. Um, and you know, again, because and they're also a partner school for us. So there are different relationships. But I think you know, principals are always looking for people who can be successful in in their setting. I think you make a good point too about those partnerships. You know, the stronger partnerships we have between programs, whether it's a a university-based program or whether it's an alternative route, that these partnerships strengthen the pre-service preparation because the knowledge about the setting that the teachers are ultimately going to end up in helps to frame the, the preparation that's happening. And they're both being responsive to the needs of the other. And do you find that that's the case in long-term partnerships? Yes, I mean, I think those partnerships make an enormous difference. And again, the residencies are an example of a very formal partnership, um, but professional development school models are another. I noticed that somebody um, else talked, let's see, talked about, again, the, uh, the shortage of special education teachers. And so special education is another area uh, where a number of the teachers are coming through alternative route pathways because not enough are being produced through the traditional routes. So, you know, again, this, this question of where the labor market demand is and what the different pathways are doing to respond to it is an important theme, I think, that is running through the responses. Absolutely. And folks will have another opportunity soon to share some other ideas with us about what's happening in their state, but I think we'll wrap up this question and move that out and let you move on to the next phase of the presentation. So um, the next phase of the presentation is going to be a deep dive into Pathways into Teaching in New York City in the um, decade roughly from 2002 to uh, 2010 which is when we were conducting the study, just to, to give a very concrete and well-elaborated example of what this looks like in a particular labor market. So some of the uh, questions we were interested in is, how do teachers enter teaching in New York City schools? How has that changed over time? And then the question motivating the study was the features of teacher preparation across programs and pathway that related to student achievement. So as I said, the work on pathways um, is, is challenging because there's so much variability within any one of these labels. So we were wanted to look at what are the features that might cut across those pathways that would then put, um, identify uh, leverage for improvement of teacher education. Um, I also want to mention that this study was initially motivated by um, people in the City University of New York who were interested again in looking at what was happening in New York City. Um, and they were one of the first people to recognize these changes in the preparation for teaching and were curious to learn more about that. So one of the, you know, again, New York is, is unique and also a microcosm for what's happening nationally. Um, and what you find is that teachers in New York are entering teaching through a wide variety of pathways. And I, that earlier slide showed you just a few of those different pathways. And those include both traditional and alternative routes. There's also a great deal of variability within the pathways on the kinds of teacher preparation that teachers are receiving. A university-based teacher education means lots of different things in the context of these programs, just as alternative route preparation meant lots of different things. So as I said, we were looking for how do we characterize that and how do we look at the level of those features to predict student impact. Um,
Um, so there are more than 100 teacher education programs in the 18 institutions that we were studying um, when we were looking at New York City. And you know, the numbers seemed to grow every time we turned around. We identified 18 uh, higher education institutions that prepared the majority of teachers for New York City schools, um, and focusing particularly on elementary education, secondary math and sciences, and special ed. I want to focus um, specifically on elementary education today. Again, one of the things that was interesting is that there were multiple pathways housed within the very same institution. So of the 16 institutions that we studied that had traditional uh, childhood education programs, 10 of them were offering both undergraduate and graduate uh, traditional programs. And then five of them were offering both the traditional college recommending programs and the New York City Teaching Fellows programs. And there were places that were offering multiple alternative routes as well. So they might be offering um, New York City Teaching Fellows programs, TFA programs, and their traditional programs. So the institutions themselves were offering competing pathways and programs. So it's a very complex, it's not only a complex landscape from the, you know, sort of the, the perspective of the city, but within the institutions themselves, it was a complex landscape. So let's look at how pathways have changed over time. And this looks at the period from 2000 to 2005. So what you can see is the yellow line represents the teachers who were teaching uh, on temporary licenses, which means they were not certified. And uh, when the Highly Qualified Teacher Act passed, those teachers could no longer be teaching in classrooms. So you see the drop in teachers who were teaching with temporary license over that period. And you see the rise of the teachers in the red line who were coming through the New York City Teaching Fellows and through Teach for America. So they're largely replacing the teachers who were teaching on temporary licenses. During this same period, and it's worth noting, while there's a, there's a slight dip in the number of teachers coming through the um, traditional pathways, that's the line in blue, um, as the demand for teachers grew in New York City over this period, that number rose, as did the number coming through the alternative routes. And then they dip at about the same rate. So it didn't mean necessarily that there were fewer teachers being prepared through the traditional route pathways. There were just a lot more teachers coming through these alternative route pathways. Um, let's look specifically at, at math, which, as I mentioned, was a shortage area and one of the areas that was targeted. So what you see, again, um, is that the number of teachers were coming through uh, TFA, through the New York City uh, Teaching Fellows, and the more teachers were still coming through the college recommended programs. But at that point, they still weren't, in 2003, still weren't producing enough math teachers to, to fill the demand. So the New York City Teaching Fellows Math Immersion Program was developed. And you can see now that that's the route through which most math teachers are prepared for New York City schools. So again, each of these subject areas has a slightly different um, progression of this. So let's talk a little bit about the, um, the data sources that we used for this. So one of the things that we did was to collect data directly from the different programs that we were studying. We collected their syllabi. We collected their course descriptions. Um, we collected all of their information about their field placement and the places they uh, placed student candidates. But we also interviewed the program directors and directors of the field experience to get more data on how on the features of that particular program. So these are the program data. At the same time, we surveyed the graduates of all of these different programs and pathways. So we surveyed them one 
once when they were finishing uh, their preparation in the spring of 2004. But then in 2005, we surveyed all first-year New York City teachers. There were 6,000 of them. And then did a follow-up survey in 2006 of teachers in their second year and also people who had left. Um, and there in those surveys, we asked them about the opportunities they had to do different things during teacher education. Finally, uh, we used administrative data from both the state and the district. So we had data on all New York City teachers um, from 1990 to 2006. And that included measures of teacher qualifications, for example, their scores on teacher certification, um, their SAT scores in many uh, instances, the universities where they had gone uh, for undergraduate. And we also had data on teacher retention from that administrative data. We also were able to link this to student achievement data um, from 2000 to 2006. I was working with a team of economists who were you know, in the early years of computing value added scores in both math and ELA. And again, that was uh, only for teachers in grades four through eight in those subjects. And we also had quite a bit of administrative data on the school characteristics of the schools and the students in the teacher's classrooms. All of that is important related to that early slide I showed you about how all of those things factor in to, to the impact of, um, on student achievement. So uh, let's think a little bit about the, the features of teacher preparation um, that make a difference. Um, First of all, we looked at 31 childhood education programs in 16 different institutions. 26 um, of these programs were, again, traditional college recommending programs in which teachers completed certification prior to becoming teacher of record. And then we also studied five alternative programs, uh, Teach for America and the New York City Teaching Fellows. Uh, at this point, uh, Teach for America did its own pre-service prepara pre preparation uh, during the summer, and New York City Teaching Fellows uh, worked with local universities, and the uh, certification uh, courses were taken through those universities. We documented five different aspects of teacher education, including the program structure. Was it undergraduate, graduate? How long did it take? So features of structure. We also looked at the kinds of opportunities that uh, candidates received in learning about learning and learners, um, specific preparation for teaching English and math, preparation for teaching ethnically and linguistically diverse students, and also the nature of field experience across all of these different programs. And this we're looking specifically at that pre-service component. So alternative routes also have field experiences that are associated with that summer intensive preparation. So some of the features, just to give you a flavor for the data, that we um, looked at under field experiments, experience in uh, talking with the program was finding out who's primarily responsible for picking the cooperating teachers. So in some instances, uh, it was the responsibility of the program entirely. In some instances, it was the school principal who chose the cooperating principal, a cooperating teacher. And in some instances, it was the candidate, him or herself, who found the cooperating teacher. So we looked at, again, the question of who was making that selection. We also looked at whether or not the program required any kind of minimum experience for cooperating teachers. So what were the requirements of cooperating teachers? Uh, what were they looking for? And we also looked at the number of times that the supervisor uh, observed the candidates in the field. So those were some of the kinds of, of uh, data that we were collecting on the quality of field experience. Um, in the data analysis, we did rely on value-added me measures, where we looked at achievement, student achievement, as a function of the student's prior achievement, the student's characteristics or uh, demographics, 
the characteristics of the classroom, which also included the characteristics of other students um, of that individual, teacher characteristics, um, so that might include, for example, their score on the certification test, uh, test, and then these program features that we were documenting, some specification of error, and in most cases, we were looking at teachers in the same school who came through different pathways. So we were trying to control for the effects of teaching in particular kind of school settings. So uh, we use school fixed effects. So what did we find? Um, and what features of preparation related to student achievement? So as I said, this, th we did two different analyses of this. One based on what we learned about the programs from the program documentation itself. And the other had to do with the survey responses of those graduates. So I'll focus first on the information we got from the program. And what we found is that um, there were a variety of things that related to student achievement, again, across programs and pathways. Um, in math, the, these four things, the um, whether or not the, the candidates were asked to do some kind of a capstone experience, which was often creating a teaching portfolio, uh, the quality of the oversight of field experience, which had to do with the number of times the supervisors observed candidates, and also the, uh, how the, the supervisors were attached to the program. The percentage of tenured faculty or tenure-line faculty who were teaching the math methods course. And again, that may have to do be a signal of the institution commitment to teacher education um, because math education faculty are actually a scarce resource. So again, this might be a signal if they were using that resource to teach in the teacher education program. It might have had to do with something, uh, something related to the value they put on that. And also the number of required math courses in the undergraduate program. So all of those were related to student achievement in math. And in ELA, the first two of those, the capstone project and the oversight of field experience, were both related. Thanks a lot, Pam. That was great to hear a little bit about the research on the different types of field experiences. I think now it would be a great time to hear from our audience about the type of field experiences in your region. So we, in our last question, talked about what types of programs you see most available, but now we'd like to hear about the field experiences within each of those programs that you are most familiar with. I see that Kim shared a little bit about the traditional prep in Maryland with over 100 days of um, time in a professional development school. And I think maybe that would be on the high end. But Pam, maybe you can speak a little more to what you see most often in terms of length of time. So again, this is one of the, um, the requirements are often set at the state level. So typically, there is a minimum number of hours or days that um, 
in traditional preparation programs that teacher candidates must engage in field experience. A um, hundred days, and the number of days has been actually going up with time as people have begun to realize the importance of field experience. Uh, states have been increasing the time that candidates spend in in uh, field in the field. And it's interesting, Christina shares that in Pennsylvania, field experiences are linked to the competencies. And how often are you seeing that connection across the state? So I would be interested in the ways in which they're, they're linked to, um, to competencies. Uh, some of it, again, and uh, 12 weeks is probably um, a, across the country, there's, that's probably pretty typical, the 12 weeks. It would be interesting to see the ways in which, again, um, part of, there's two things that field experience is good for. One is learning how to teach, right? So the idea is that whatever you're learning in the university, you need to have opportunities to try out and practice in the field setting and get feedback on. But it's also, and this may be the competency piece, an assessment opportunity. So typically, um, student teachers are evaluated, and a decision is made about whether or not they are, should be recommended for certification based on the quality of their student teaching in school. Um, student teaching refers generally to the portion of field experience where people actually take full responsibility, although I noticed in at least one of the respons responses there's also co-teaching models. Um, and earlier field experiences are times when te the student, uh, the teaching teacher candidates um, might be engaged in other kinds of activities and have less than full responsibility. So you're you're seeing a mix of that in the responses. That's interesting, and I see a more specific question coming in from Gary um, related to the quality of teacher candidates being compared. And I think that the question is, mm -hmm. the retention and quality is lacking compared to alternative candidates. This skews the data in favor of non-traditional candidates. Um, could you speak to that issue? I don't know if that's, that would be that yeah, that's a very that's a very good question. And again, it has to do, again, with that issue of uh, the, the, the qualifications of the candidate and the nature of the program and where people are going. Um, so again, in um, alternative programs also generally place teachers, not always, but often place teachers in the hardest to staff schools that are less desirable for teachers coming out of more traditional programs. So Gary's right that in some ways you have this apples and oranges um, issue. That's part of the reason that in some of the models we use, we do control for entering qualifications. If you control for those qualifications, again, you see less of a difference between the routes. Part of what people from um, some of the alternative routes, and particularly TFA, are bringing are much higher entering qualifica academic qualifications. And I also see another comment about project-based inquiry learning and as part of the field experiences. Mm. What's your understanding and knowledge about that? So um, again, going back to that capstone project that uh, showed up as something that predicted student achievement, in some instances those uh, capstone projects were an example of uh, teacher inquiry or teacher research in which the pre-service teachers were investigating something in their classrooms, and that was part of the requirement for um, completing the preparation program. And that's, you know, in a number of programs, that kind of emphasis on teacher inquiry and studying one's own practice is part of the preparation experience. Um, there's another comment as well. Um, that the rubrics for field experience can be aligned with national and state competencies and core standards. And again, that's uh, true in, in California as well, that some of the observations are linked to the California standards for the teaching profession. Um, others, other places are beginning to experiment with using the kinds of rubrics that might be used for teacher evaluation 
within a particular district. So impact, for example, in uh, Washington, D.C. So this alignment between how people are supervised in teacher preparation and how they're going to be evaluated once they uh, enter a district is another interesting question and one that is, I think, beginning to, to shift a little bit as um, observation becomes a part of teacher evaluation um, in a number of different states and districts. And I think also what, what might be key here is aligning the field experiences as closely as possible with the intended placement of a teacher, so meaning that where they're getting their experiences would be in a place that is as close as possible to where they think they may teach. So if you're looking at maybe going into an urban setting, having a field experience that mirrors that, whereas if you're in more rural or you know, a particular content area or grade level, it seems that those those areas of focus would be really important in ensuring that people are getting the experience in this type of setting where they'll end up. Yes, and actually that was one of the features that also predicted student achievement was the similarity between um, both the grade level and subject that uh, candidates were teaching during their student teaching and what they were teaching in their first year of teaching. So I think that issue of sort of the similarity of context um, is important because to a certain extent if you're teaching in a very similar context, your prior year's experience becomes re very relevant. But if you've been teaching kindergarten during your student teaching and then you're placed in a fifth grade classroom, you're almost like a first year, you know, you're, you're learning all over again. So again, right. part of that, that part of that may also have to do with uh, principals being savvy about where they place people based on their student teaching experiences. Exactly, that hiring and placement and aligning the candidates to the right roles would be a good good thing to address there. Absolutely. Well, it looks like we're ready to move along and uh, hear a little bit more about the results that you found um, from some of this work. Okay, terrific. Uh, we're now going to move to the survey data. So um, these were the results based on the surveys from those first year teachers who um, had graduated from the programs that we were studying. So here are some of the examples of the questions we asked and the uh, factors we were looked at, looking at. So one of the things that we looked at is um, the opportunities to, so what we talked about are sort of opportunities grounded in practice. And these are very similar to the kinds of approximations of practice that I talk about in some of my work on the teaching of practice. Um, this meant that candidates reported whether or not they had opportunities to do things like listening to an individual read aloud for assessing uh, reading achievement, um, an IRA, for example, um, planning a guided reading lesson, or studying or analyzing student math work. So these were all kinds of things that they would be expected to do as teachers that they had had opportunities to practice during teacher education. Another uh, practice-related opportunity was the opportunity to actually uh, learn about the New York City math curriculum or reading curriculum. Um, and to what extent did they have um, opportunities to do that in teacher education? We also looked at the extent to which they had opportunities for student teaching. And remember, this was across both traditional and alternative routes. So not everybody across those pathways necessarily had extended student teaching. And then, again, related to this issue of coherence, we looked to the congruence of field experiences. So as you can see here, it's the experiences that were similar in terms of grade level or similar in terms of subject area. So that gives you a feel for some of the survey questions. So what we found was that for um, predicting the impact on student achievement in math, uh, that was related to these opportunities to try out practices such as analyzing student work or teaching a lesson. So uh, candidates who had had more opportunities to do those things actually had greater impact on student achievement. Um, opportunities to review the, the math curriculum were another thing that predicted uh, math achievement. Opportunities to student teach. 
Um, so having no opportunity to student teach was negatively related to student achievement. And also that congruence between the placement in student teaching and the first teaching assignment. These were all related to the impact on uh, the math achievement results. In ELA, it was related to fewer of these variables, but again, it was related to those practice-based opportunities. Um, and it was related to opportunities to review the New York City ELA curriculum. So again, it had to do in some ways with the um, extent to which the opportunities that candidates had were really grounded in the practices of teaching and prepared them for the work they would need to do as first-year teachers. So what did we learn from the Pathways study? Um, first, and I think uh, very importantly, we learned that there is uh, a lot of variation in the experiences of people in these uh, pathways and programs. Variation in field experience, variation in the kinds of assignments they were given, and variation in content. And this was in the context of a state that actually has a lot of regulation around uh, teacher preparation. So New York State is unusually um, rigorous, I would say, in terms of uh, specifications for what teachers in both alternative and traditional routes need to do in teacher education. There were some features of preparation that we were able to identify that were linked to student subsequent impact. And we also looked at um, the impact of institutions on uh, student achievement. And we found some institutions who were much more, were producing graduates who were much more effective in the first year of teaching, and a few who were much less effective. So there also did seem to be, but most of the institutions were um, grouped together. Great. Thanks, Pam. Uh, at this point, I think we're going to take another minute to have people tell us about the different pathways and your perception of how well you think those pathways in your district or state or region are preparing teachers for the realities of teaching. So realistically, you know, the things we've already asked about, traditional versus alternative, and the types of field experiences, taking all that into consideration, how well do you think the components of the program are working together to prepare teachers for what they really need once they enter a classroom? So Elka's making the same comment we touched on in the last poll related to how closely the experience, field experiences mirror the actual setting where teachers are placed for their first teaching position. And I think we've acknowledged that that is an important thing to consider. And that's part of what's given rise, I think, to the interest in teacher residency programs. Um, because again, it's the sense that, and, and also the interest in, in um, charter management organizations, in a sense, growing their own teachers, is being able to provide more context-specific teacher preparation. So you can learn the classroom management system that that particular district or that particular uh, CMO uses uh, it, when you're still in your preparation phase. You're much better prepared when you take over. You already have that. Similarly, if you are focused on the standards and expectations for that uh, particular district or school, you have uh, a leg up when you start to teach. And Pam, have, has there been any research on how 
well those teachers are retained or are satisfied with the position, you know, once they have a few years under their belt? Well, again, the, the early uh, work on residency programs suggests um, that they have higher retention than um, some other kinds of alternative route programs. Again, some of that has to do with selection. Uh, so residency programs are really interested in attracting people who are going to make a commitment to that particular district, and that's part of the um, selection of candidates into those programs. So on one hand, it's not surprising that they stay longer. They've made that commitment up front. Um, on the other hand, it may also ha have something to do with how well prepared they feel for that for teaching in that particular district or school. Uh, Yvonne raises an interesting point, and Susan Moore Johnson has done some interesting work on this, that um, effective preparation is a combination of characteristics of the candidate, what they are bringing in, characteristics of the school or district and what they're looking for, and then characteristics of the program. And that, again, if people are coming in with a lot of um, experience, so for example, there are programs to prepare paraprofessionals who work within uh, districts to become classroom teachers. They bring a lot of knowledge of students and of that district and perhaps of families that can be built on, and they may, might need a different kind of emphasis in their program from somebody who's coming in uh, straight out of undergraduate, who's had very little experience in schools. So again, part of, and Troops to Teachers is another example of a program that um, focuses on the characteristics of the individuals and what they might be bringing from that experience. One of the interesting things we found in this study is that having prior experience or um, you know, different people who had a lot of experience in a different field prior to coming into teaching were not necessarily more successful. Um, so certain things that we might think would predict success didn't necessarily. Uh, but it certainly might mean that they need a different kind of preparation to be successful. I think that that speaks a little bit to this issue of some of our career changers have some content knowledge expertise and enter teaching with that and the program and the experience helps them to fill in the pedagogical aspect of teaching and often that bridge and having the two pieces come together is not quite as seamless as we would want it to be. And I think Gary spoke a little bit about this, the classroom management strategies. But how do you see that playing out with the alternative programs and the fact that people may come with a high degree of content knowledge and expertise but lack the pedagogical skills that they might need? Yes, I mean, I think that this is, um, this is a really interesting point. I think for a long time our graduates have been telling teacher education programs that they don't feel well prepared enough in classroom management. And this is something certainly in the alternative routes they've focused much more attention on. But I think, I think university-based programs are also beginning to shift to have more emphasis on those basic organizational and management skills because they're critical for success. At the same time, once you've managed, once you've learned how to manage a classroom, you need to know how to teach your subject matter. So it's always balancing both of those things and making sure that people, you know, we have relatively limited time in teacher education. When I did the cross-professional study of the preparation of clergy, clinical psychologists, and teachers, one of the first things that struck me is that it takes roughly five years to prepare um, a minister or a rabbi, and that's after four years of undergraduate. It takes roughly the same to prepare a clinical psychologist, and we get much less time to prepare teachers for arguably more complex work. So again, one of the, one of the things we're always struggling with is how do you prepare someone not only for that first year of teaching, 
but to continue to learn about teaching during those early years um, because they won't know everything they need to know when they enter the classroom. And I think that point really ties into the issue of professional learning and what are our schools and districts providing to teachers in, by the way of professional development and ongoing professional learning experiences that allow them to build their skills over time and then that application of the skills to their particular context in the setting where they are teaching. And mm -hmm. that's widely variable across schools and districts. So one teacher could go to a, a particular school that has very strong professional learning context and another could go where they have very little support and uh, opportunities for growth in that area. And I think, and you probably know more about what the research says, but that teachers who have more of those experiences to continue learning as they're in their first few years of teaching and beyond may be more satisfied and may be more likely to remain in the profession. I think that this issue of, again, how you support beginning teachers in those first years on the job is incredibly important. Um, and I also think help, part of professional education is helping novices think about how do you go on learning? How do you seek out resources? How do you take advantage of any resources that exist in your area? If they're not in your school, how do you find them through networks, through professional networks, through professional development opportunities? And again, I think that's one thing on uh, an area in which these programs may differ, is the extent to which they prepare people to continue to learn and seek out those opportunities. Um, and also provide, again, many programs that are cohort-based. Basically, you, you've given them a cohort uh, with whom they can stay in touch and continue to learn from. So I think those things are very important. One of the things that we found in the work that we did around that surveying um, those first-year teachers is that the thing that most predicted retention was actually the quality of the school leader and school administrator. So again, the environment in which teachers are working has a lot to do with whether or not they decide to stay or leave. That's, that's an interesting topic that I've also studied myself and um, one I think that's worth paying a lot more attention to. Yeah. Um, I'm going to touch on one more thing here and then we'll move along to some of our conclusion slides. But um, the comment made by Elizabeth and uh, ties in a little bit closely to what Yvonne is mentioning related to um, who is actually supporting and maybe evaluating novice teachers or pre-service teachers. And maybe can you speak a little bit to the fact that when teachers are pre-service, whether they're being supported by someone from their program versus someone at the school, and then how that carries out when they're in their first years of teaching. So what Elizabeth is saying is that with the residency program she's familiar with, the teachers are supported in their first year, three years with a coach from the program. Right. I would think that that's not quite as typical because that's a pretty extensive level of support. Right. So again, one of the, one of the uh, strengths of a residency model is that there's in some ways can be a more seamless transition from pre-service teacher education into induction, those first years of teaching. Typically, that's a break, right, in which higher education is responsible for pre-service and districts are responsible or, or schools are responsible for mentoring and induction. Um, so I think the consistency of supervision or mentoring that residency programs might be able to provide could definitely be a strength. Um, I think in general the quality of the supervisor and the cooperating teacher probably matter enormously. So we did find that the, the extent to which the supervisors were, were both visiting candidates on a regular basis, the more frequent actually was a better predictor, but also were well connect, connected to the university program so they knew what they were learning and could help them make that translation was an important feature. Um, I think some people are, are also interested in looking at whether or not being placed with a cooperating teacher who him or herself is more effective, again, has an impact on the effectiveness of the student teachers once they go on to teach on their own. 
We actually don't know the answer to that question yet, but I think there are a number of people who are beginning to work on that. That would be really interesting. I think it's a great uh, point. Um, at this time, I think we're going to move right along and have you wrap up with our conclusion slides. So again, you know, I think the interests of states and districts and principals um, is in the end, end of teacher educators is how we produce more first-year teachers who could have greater impact on student achievement. How do we how do we put out teachers who, in that first year, are able to really support students in learning? Um, we know that right now, first-year teachers generally have a, a negative impact relative to other teachers. But we also know from our research that there were programs who were putting out people who behaved more like second-year teachers. So how can we you know, make sure that teacher education as a system is producing more of those teachers? And how do we ensure that teachers are well prepared to enact the practices that we know support student learning. So first of all, I think what we can say is that there is a tremendous variability right now in achievement gains within pathways. So it's this, you know, there's been a debate about which pathway is better, traditional or alternative better. And in many ways, that's not a very fruitful debate because of the amount of variation within those labels. So we think it's much more important to talk uh, more about focusing on the quality of preparation across those different labels. Um, and that the solution to producing high quality teachers is learning from what each of these different pathways does well and making them more common across pathways. So again, I think we can learn a lot about selection and recruitment from some of the alternative route pathways. who have done a very good job, I think, of increasing interest in teaching, in getting more diverse candidates to apply, um, in finding people who have strong academic ability to come into the classroom. And I think that we can all learn from some of that. At the same time, I think we can learn more about the kind of professional knowledge for teaching. Um, and teaching reading is a good example, and how best to to prepare novice teachers to go in and enact that kind of instruction at high quality in those early years in the classroom. So we think that um, designing the best possible preparation program means learning from what different programs and routes are doing successfully. Um, I also think we need to, it's important to take both retention and impact on student achievement into account. There's a lot of emphasis right now on the student achievement um, and the outcome of teacher education programs and building that into accountability measures for teacher education programs. At the same time, I think we need to attend to the retention issue. Because as we've seen from our own studies, high attrition weakens a pathway's impact on student achievement over time. So I think as we think about holding teacher education programs accountable, we need to think about both of those issues, the impact on student achievement and the impact on retention as we combine the both, both of those. Um, third, I think we need to think hard about the issue of being responsive to labor market needs. Alternative routes took off in part because colleges and universities were not nimble in responding to the needs of districts and particularly their um, difficulties in staff, staffing either certain schools or certain subjects. So I think, again, part of what we can learn is how do we work more in partnership with the districts and schools who hire our graduates to become responsive to their needs and what they need to um, the kinds of teachers that they're looking for. And this is, again, I think something we can learn about across the different pathways. Great, thank you, Pam. Uh, at this time, we'd like to start the wrap up by having participants consider what were your key takeaways from today's presentation. Um, first, we'll, we'll put up a poll to ask about that. And then secondly, we would like you to consider what action steps you plan to take related to what you learned today.
So we'll have both polls up there simultaneously, and you can respond to both or either. But we're really interested in finding out what, what you may have learned that you didn't know before today and how you can use that in your context. And Pam, maybe while we're waiting for um, some of the responses to come in, we can raise a question that I know has come up and you and I have talked a little bit about, but this issue of the preparation program preparing teachers for the realities of Common Core implementation and the mm -hmm. fact that we have this big movement right now and this transition taking place nationwide to the Common Core state standards and the next generation assessments. And the question on everyone's mind is how are preparation programs really responding to that and tailoring their program to that, this new focus. And w what can you tell us about that? Well, I think it's something that teacher education programs are, in the states that have adopted the Common Core are thinking about right now. Um, and there's two parts to it. The first is making sure, you know, for a while now, teacher education programs have been responsible for ensuring that their graduates understand the standards within their particular state. So for a long time, for example, the Stanford Teacher Education Program has had students make sure that they know how to align um, the work they're doing with the California state standard. So in some ways, that standard-based approach is not new. In many states, um, that's often a requirement that you state the state standards that they're addressing, even in the syllabus. Um, what will be different, of course, is is the nature of the standards. And the standards in the Common Core and New Generation standards are much more ambitious. The standards state what students should be able to achieve. They don't actually say what teachers need to do in order to help students achieve that. So part of the work that needs to be done is to really think hard about what are the core practices for teaching to those standards that new teachers will need to master. So for example, one of, the, uh, one of the things that cuts across all of the standards is the expectation that students will be engaged in much more ambitious kinds of classroom discussion in which they're asked to respond to each other's ideas, to construct evidence-based arguments. It's really quite a sophisticated notion of classroom discussion that we know is completely at odds with what kids are currently doing. So, you know, I participated in the Measures of Effective Teaching Study, so I had the opportunity to view lots and lots of video of classrooms. And in most classrooms, kids have very few opportunities to talk. So that's an example of something that teacher education programs are going to really have to think about. How are we preparing our teachers to conduct and orchestrate these kinds of rich classroom discussions that are envisioned by the Common Core Standards? And I also know from some other research that, you know, that's not something that uh, gets a lot of attention right now in teacher education. The mathematical practices component of the math standards will be another one. That's something that not only will prospective math teachers need to understand what are, the, what are those practices, what do they look like, but what kind of teaching supports the use of those practices. So it's both getting candidates to be familiar with those expectations. What does that look like? What does high quality work um, towards those standards look like? But then what are, the, what are the core practices that novices need to develop in order to help kids succeed? Right. And I think, you know, along with all of that, having good models for what this new type of instruction really looks like. So, Going back to a point that we made earlier, having the cooperating teachers or the, the teachers that we're observing as for the pre-service teachers, making sure that those people have the skills that we're aiming for and are able to demonstrate that and be good models for teachers who are learning about this new way to provide instruction. Right. So again, I think that that will have implications for assessment. How do we assess our student teachers? Um, 
if we can identify the kind of core practices, some having to do with management, we've talked about that, some having to do with the teaching of, of reading, um, the teaching of mathematics, that we would expect all graduates to be proficient in, then how do we develop assessments to ensure that graduates really are proficient before we send them out into the field? Um, I think that would be a huge um, bonus for teacher education to have sort of practice-based assessments that uh, ensure that candidates can actually enact these things. It's not just a matter of what they've had opportunities to learn, but what they're actually able to do. And there's a lot of great comments coming in about the takeaways and the action steps pl folks plan to take. Um, trying to read through these a little bit. And uh, I see Jackie comments on the fact that we need great leadership. And I would 100% agree with that. And we did mention that a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but maybe you can speak a little bit more about any of the research on that and how important the leadership is or, or what we're finding about that. I can. I think preparing leaders uh, principals who are instructional leaders, leaders and know how to support novice teachers, particularly as we have more and more new teachers in many of our, our schools, um, is, a, is a critically important part of the job. You know, when we, as part of that survey of first-year teachers, we also looked at the kind of mentoring um, that new teachers reported getting. And that was the year in which New York City required mentoring for first-year teachers. So it was, it was a fortuitous that we were doing the survey that year. And one of the things that we found is that uh, it was really interesting. Most of the mentoring focused on emotional support or on classroom management, and relatively little focused on instruction. Or, for example, meeting the needs of English learners which is a huge challenge in New York City. Uh, what we found is that in schools where um, more teachers reported positive things about the administrators um, and the su administrative support, those new teachers were more likely to get mentoring focused on instruction. So there's something that leaders are able to do in terms of ensuring that the resources um, support those um, new teachers and that those resources are focused on instruction, um, that I think is, again, very striking. Yeah, that makes sense. And also related to your previous comment that a lot of it goes back to their placement, their hiring and selection decisions, and how they're deciding to place teachers based on the skill set that they might be bringing into the school. Yeah, exactly. But also, you know, I think savvy principals also use um, partnerships with universities and teacher education programs as a pipeline to find good teachers. You know, I've watched this over time. I had, there are some principals who are really good at choosing our best candidates time after time <laughs> and uh, are very picky about the kinds of people they have student teaching in their school and then often hire them. So, uh, you know, I think there is a lot that those principals are doing um, in their work with uh, teacher education programs that help them recruit successful teachers. I noticed that Gary also mentioned the need to collaborate more with school districts about the placement of new teachers. And I think that's a, you know, that's a great example of where I think that um, that's something that alternative routes are generally stronger at and, and um, have developed out of that need. But I think it's something that all programs could be uh, more successful at having those discussions and where is it that you need teachers. The other thing that I, that I think is um, interesting is the extent to which universities talk among each other about uh, their role in the broader teacher education landscape. So in New York, we found every institution was preparing secondary math teachers, for example. But most of them were preparing very few secondary math teachers. They were preparing four or eight. That was the average number of secondary math programs. It takes a lot of resources to prepare high-quality math teachers, the high-quality math educators, the supervisors, high-quality placements. So you know, another way to think about this is that maybe not every teacher education program offers soup to nuts. 
you know, maybe some programs, if you're in a setting where there are a lot of programs, say, we're really going to focus in on the production of outstanding special education teachers or teachers who are dual credentialed and regular ed, and, and, and we won't do some of these other things so we can concentrate our resources. You know, that would be a really, and then make sure that districts want to hire our grads. So that's another way of thinking a little bit about this from a labor market perspective. And I think that, you know, I have some experience with the transition to teaching program, uh, pr grant program funded by the U.S. Department of Ed, and I think some of the teacher quality programs that aim to do just that and provide resources to uh, schools and partnerships that would focus in on some of those labor market needs in particular areas. Yeah. And spending some of our efforts in that way to target those particular needs, um, I'm sure there's already some research about that, but um, I think people are recognizing that that might be the way to go, is to put your focus on one area or a few areas and try to do that really well exactly. and um, meet the needs of, of your region. Mm -hmm. Um, I think at this time we're going to wrap up these takeaways and move right along so that we can let people ask any questions they might have before we're out of time. In just a moment you'll see another pop-up box and this is your opportunity participants to ask any questions you might have for Pam related to what you heard in today's presentation or any other related questions um, that you have about applying what you've heard to the practice that you have um, in your context. I guess we answered all the questions. <laughs> I know. And we, ha we have a few questions that came in um, before the session, and so I'm wondering maybe if you can respond to one of these. Uh, related to qualifications, um, as, as programs admit students, whether traditional or alternative, and the types of characteristics they may be looking for in teacher candidates, you spoke a little bit about this, but could you elaborate a little bit on how much that matters and what our program's doing to seek out particular um, skills and dispositions of teacher candidates? Yeah. I think this is this, the issue of teacher qualifications um, has been a huge topic in, in teacher education for a long time. And you'll often see reports bemoaning the fact that teachers um, come from uh, the lower half of college graduates in terms of things like grade point average or SAT scores. You know, again, one of the challenges um, of teacher education is that we need so many teachers. So uh, we could never fill all of the teaching positions from the top 10% or even top 25%. We would need people to only go into teaching and not into any of the other professions um, to even get close to being able to fill classrooms with teachers who, who come from that. So, you know, in part, and again, I think this is part of where we have to really think about is, uh, is the ways in which preparation can address wherever people come in and how to make them strong and meet that bar. At the same time, I think it's, it's true that we're learning a little bit more that um, these qualifications do matter and the extent to which you can select people who have stronger academic qualifications, stronger uh, certification scores, stronger SAT scores. Individually, they may not be predictive, but some of the work my team has done has suggested that collectively, that, that cluster of things is predictive. And again, it's part of, I think, um, something that explains the TFA results, is they are, they are selecting people who have those characteristics as they come in. Um, so I think um, 
I think that that leads to a broader policy debate about how do we make teaching a more desirable profession for the most talented college graduates. And I think that's a critical debate in this country. I think that other countries that are that we would like to emulate, um, teachers have much higher status. Uh, and I think that uh, we need to think about as a country, do we really value teachers? And if we do, what it would it mean to, again, pay them commensurate with some of the other professions, to support them in ways um, that we can have a hope of not only attracting but retaining really talented people in the profession. So I think that's something that I'm very interested in and um, I think is, is a debate that the country is now ready to have, particularly as we look at some of these international comparisons. And Pam, would you say that that is not an issue that's going to be solely solved by increasing pay, but there are a variety of other factors that really tie closely into teachers' desire to, or people's desire to go into teaching and stay in teaching. So what I guess what I'm asking is that just increasing salaries will not, will not be the only solution, but there are a variety of other things that we need to look at to make there are, a yeah. desirable profession. I think there are, uh, it's not only, I mean, there's research that suggests it's not only salary, but salary certainly is a part of it. And, you know, I work at a place where, um, at Stanford, where, you yeah, know, I think there are a lot of undergraduates who would be interested in teaching. And I talk with a lot of undergraduates who are interested in teaching. But one, they're worried about how would, could they possibly pay off their student loans if they decided to become an elementary or high school teacher. So, you know, again, this is something that uh, government policy can do something about. We used to have policies that had loan forgiveness for people who chose to teach in high poverty schools for a number of years. Those are very effective ways of, again, addressing some of the costs um, of, uh, that face people as they go out. Um, I think um, there have been districts, like San Francisco passed a proposition to raise initial teacher compensation to see if they were able to attract um, a stronger pool of candidates. And they showed that they were. They, by raising the initial teacher salary, they were recruiting more people who maybe wanted to teach in an urban setting. But again, the pay differential between uh, San Francisco and Palo Alto is such that they might not be able to afford to do that and, again, pay off their student loans. So um, I think that, that increasing compensation is one piece of it. It's not all of it. I think providing better working conditions, more support, treating teachers as professionals. Um, you know, we run a lot of professional development here at Stanford in the summer. And one of the comments that simultaneously um, saddens me and makes me happy is the comment we get about how they felt, how much they valued being treated as professionals and how rare that is. Again, I think we're not going to be able to keep really talented people in the profession if we don't treat them professionally. I agree. That's an excellent point, and I'm sure many of our participants on the line would agree with that. Um, I have another question that came in from Martha, and she's asking about what do you see as the first step in a strategic plan that a traditional teacher prep uh, higher education program should take to be more responsive to the labor market and new student needs? Oh, that's a great question. I love that question. Um, I think one is, is, again, having strong connections to the districts that hire your graduates and having mechanisms for ongoing conversations and sharing um, data about where, again, you know, five years out, where those needs are likely to be and what they're looking for. So when I was teaching at the University of Washington, we had, I don't know if I'm going to get the exact acronym, but the Professional Education Review Board or something like that, that consisted of school district officials and um, staff from the teacher education program. And we met regularly to talk again about what the needs of those districts were, 
um, how their perception of how well we were doing and preparing teachers who met their needs. So having structures in place that allow you to have that conversation. Districts are often, you know, again, depending on the district, they can look at this a year, two years out. They can begin to see where they're going to have those needs. So I think engaging uh, districts in that conversation, getting those data, having uh, conversations where they can begin to say, these are the ways in which we think you're doing a really good job, and, and these are places where we feel like you know, you're not producing the teachers we need. Thanks a lot, Pam. I think that was a helpful response to Martha's question. Um, and just to let everyone know that any of the questions that were uh, asked during the registration when you signed up for this webinar or any of the questions you've asked today that we haven't had an opportunity to respond to, we'll be putting together an FAQ document that will be posted on the RHEL Mid-Atlantic website. And you should all receive an email following today's webinar with some follow-up regarding the survey we'd like you to take and regarding the link to get to this site where you can find the resources. So um, this FAQ document will be there as well as the presentation, the slides that we've gone through today. And there will be some, uh, in coming weeks, hopefully the archive of the webinar for viewing. And if you want to share that with others who are not able to attend today, you should be able to find that at the website. Uh, so at this time, we're going to wrap up the Q&A. And uh, we'll just close out the session by giving you a little bit more information about where you can find additional information on this topic. And as you see on your slide now, the Center to Support Excellence in Teaching at Stanford is a site you can go to and learn more about Pathways into Teaching and more about the work that Dr. Grossman is doing. You can contact any of us if you have additional questions on this topic or specifically on the teacher effectiveness series. You can be in touch with me. And if you'd like to continue this conversation on teacher effectiveness and specifically on the issue of pathways into teaching, you can find at our RHEL Mid-Atlantic site, we have a set of forums on the topics that we've addressed. And you can go in there and continue the discussion with other folks who were part of today's webinar and invite others that you know would be interested in discussing this topic. Um, that's a place where the conversation can certainly continue. And we have our next webinar and our final in the series for this year. In two weeks from today, we'll be touching on the teacher's role in quality classroom interactions and um, same time, and we hope that you'll make the time to join us for that event. And then in 2014, early in the year, we'll be starting the second year of the series with a whole host of new topics uh, related to teacher effectiveness. And then we have another new series beginning where we'll bring back the presenters from this year's series, and you'll have more time to interact with them and continue the conversations about the various topics and get engaged with the colleagues um, across the state on how they're addressing these different topics in the coming year.